for today's final discussion, please welcome Sir Taras Senior Managing Director, Tom Klein, in conversation with Skift founder and CEO, Rafat Ali. Thank you for, uh, thank you for continuing to stay with us. Every, everybody who's watching, um, this is the last, but I hope the best session of the day. Um, Tom Klein, who works for Sir Taras, has uh, uh, been a lifer at Sabre, would be fair to say, Tom? Yeah, a little bit of American Airlines before that, but yeah, it's pretty much a life. 20, 20, 28 years 28 between years? the two. Between the two, yeah, wow. 20, 23 um, of them at Sabre. And so you, you've seen pretty much everything in travel there is to see from both the ground operations level as well as the big picture. You've been at uh, what would be fair to say the most active firm in travel in the last, certainly in the last two years, but, but maybe even more than that. Sure. You've been with them. Uh, since I think three three years now, three and a half years. Three and a half years, yeah. And so um, we've spoken to Greg Greg um, O'Hara, who's the founder of the firm, uh, well known in the travel industry. This is the first time we're speaking to you mm -hmm. as part of that. Um, you've done a bunch of deals um, in the last two years, and uh, I talked to Greg in September last year at the Global Forum. We did this on video. Uh, I'm so glad you are here, yeah. um, face to face. Uh, what have you seen sort of now two and a half years, I guess two years into the pandemic, you're looking at the next phase of deals now. You've done, I would say in the last six months, the, the, the big was the Hertz deal you did. That was probably one of the biggest deals uh, that was there. Uh, you've done some deals maybe since then as well. In terms of opportunities, year three into the pandemic, um, what are the big, big opportunities? Yeah, seeing? well, let, before I start, I just want to thank you and your team for keeping us and all of our portfolio companies informed and, and, and stimulating some thought with your, not just Appreciate things like today, you. but also your daily, the things that get pushed to us daily. So thanks, thanks to you Appreciate and your team for you. doing that. Um, you know, we were talking earlier that we thought we came into the pandemic with a very conservative uh, point of view. We, we, we knew things weren't going to go away quickly and recover as quickly as some of the other drops that we had seen in the travel industry. We've always, you know, there's a long history, and I used to have to talk about this at Sabre to investors, and we talk about it at Sataris all the time, that the industry has a very resilient history of when there's been shocks to the, to the system, so to speak, there's been very aggressive recoveries, um, and we still believe that'll happen. But the length of this is, is obviously extraordinary. And we had gone into it saying to our portfolio companies, um, you know, let's assume business doesn't come back for a year. Now, you know, as a former CEO, I can tell you most of us are pretty optimistic. So none right. of our CEOs love that discussion or that exercise. Um, but we thought that was pretty conservative. And even as we went out and talked to target companies about investment, they were all saying, you know, well, we think six months from now it's going to come back. And, so here we are, um, two and a half years in. I think in the, if you're in certain, certain parts of the leisure market, you're worried that you're going to lose another summer, which means you're going to have three years of pretty catastrophic right. things going on in your business. And then there's segments of the market that are doing reasonably well. Um, but as far as opportunity goes, you know, we haven't been in situations where we've had to rescue companies, so to speak. I mm -hmm. think we saw opportunities to are you, either, either are you surprised by how few distressed uh, activity there has been in general in travel? You would have assumed there have been more, right? Yeah, I think it depends on what you call distressed. And I think one of the comments I would make is it's still playing out, right? I mean, governments have poured money into companies. Um, some governments cannot forgive that money. Some governments can. Right. But there's parts of the world where, where there's a lot of government debt on balance sheets that you know, if you if you just do the math, it's 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 hard to understand how they could ever get repaid. Right. So there's still going to be distress coming out of this, and you know we're in a period right now where some companies continue to burn cash. It's been a long time, and and companies that are you know really great opportunities for for folks like Sataris are saying you know sometimes they're families that have said we never want to take on third party capital, but you get tired after three years. And your point of view might change. And, and when it does, if you are going to take capital, you want to do it with somebody that can actually partner with you and help you grow your business and help you get out of this. And yeah, we sit in a pretty good spot to be able to do that. So we're very bullish on continuing to invest. Um, we invested twice as much during the pandemic as we had before the pandemic mm -hmm. uh, in total. And your so, team has also grown quite a bit, I think. Yeah, quite a bit. And right now we're focused on expanding 
European team. But we've gone from, I mean, three and a half years ago, I was the 12th person on the team. Uh, we're at north of 40. Tom, they're gonna, the, your mic is going in and out. OK, north of 40 today. And, um, and we continue to see opportunities to grow. And, and so you know, we, we, we had one investment vehicle. Today we have four strategies. Um, so we cut across uh, our core private equity fund. We have a debt fund. We have a, um, a hotel hospitality related fund that we've now purchased five hotels. And we have, uh, we just did our first close on a small VC fund. So we're cutting across uh, a bunch of different strategies. So those, the, the, the last two are new. So the hotel one, I know we started talking about it last year with, with yes. Greg a little bit. So you're buying actual hotels. Um, explain what the philosophy there is. Yeah, I mean, we, we thought there was going to be a dislocation in the market. We also saw opportunities come our way. So we get, you know, we, we, there's still sections of the market where we don't have a strategy. And we get a lot of calls from... I mean, all we do is spend time with travel companies all day long, right? right? We talk to CEOs all day long. Um, so as they have opportunities or as they're trying to solve problems, they may ask us. And we started to see that we were kind of referring opportunities too often in a couple of different places. Credit was one of them. So mm -hmm. we started with, the, you know, we raised a billion and a half dollars with a partner. And uh, we started the credit fund that's, you know, 75% invested at this point. Um, the hospitality fund was similar. We would see opportunities. We met a real estate team that we really liked that was coming out of a firm that de-emphasized hospitality. Mm. Um, and we basically brought that whole team in. And uh, again, they've, they've now invested in, in five hotels. It's pretty much North American centric. Yeah. Um, Luxury end, fair to say? All, various. We, we, uh, um, we have a, a, down a brand new downtown embassy suites in Atlanta. Um, mm. We have a, a luxury hotel on Brickell. In, in Miami, uh, we have kind of a business transient hotel in Washington D.C. So it's a little bit over the map, but um, but the team is 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 really strong and, and really good at finding what we think are good values in places where our distribution assets can help support the hotel as well. Right, and you've used that, and we've done some stories on um, TripAdvisor and how uh, Sotaris is helping TripAdvisor get some inventory, for instance, for their new TripAdvisor Plus that they launched last year, maybe leveraging, I forget what it exactly was, maybe it was Amex GBT leveraging into, um, but I could be mistaken, but, but leveraging this. So how much of, of your thought goes into leveraging what you have in the portfolio for the portfolio company? I mean, we always start there, right? We always start with how does this fit um, with our broader portfolio and are there opportunities across our, uh, our companies? But, you know, look, as a, as a private equity firm, um, maybe I could start with what we, what we don't do and what we do do. Right. We're not, we don't have a gigantic operations team where we send in you know, a, an army of people like some private equity firms do like to TPG actually do the work for the right. team. Right? We, we bring a level of expertise that um, hopefully we're, as we work through a deal, we're partnering with the management team to say, you know, how can we enable your growth? And that's either with capital, sometimes it's with expertise, sometimes it's with um, cross portfolio synergies. We look for all of those things. Um, sometimes with tech investment, we've been pretty pretty aggressive about using capital to invest in technology. We did that at American Express initially, where the entire infrastructure is brand new after the spin out, um, and we're, we'll we'll do that at Hertz, where where we think the digital experience uh, requires some investment, and we're it's working hard at that. So we we have a couple of things that will run as a play. And one of those things is always, how can the companies help each other? That said, um, we do that arm's length, right? It has to be good for both companies, um, but where we see opportunities, we definitely go after them. And on the venture side, and I know um, you've at least toyed with the idea of venture in the past, just didn't really go there. You just said you're now uh, closed on a small venture fund. So uh, you've stayed away from it. I think I've talked to Greg in the past, and uh, you know, the valuation has always been the valuation expectations was always an issue. Uh, and so what's your thinking there on the early side? Yeah, I, again, it's it's back to once in a while we would see something we really liked and we just didn't have a vehicle to invest in it. So we could we could put up some money personally if we chose, right. Right, pass the hat and, and, and invest. But we thought it would be good um, to have a strategy for that sector, it's again, it's not going to be a big emphasis. If you, it's, it's, we're talking about millions of dollars versus billions of dollars right. in the other funds. So, um, you know, I'll, like, 
yeah, we just, we, we got tired of passing on things that we thought we could really be helpful with. Yeah. So we'll have a, a small amount of, small, amount small of team and separate from our private equity team. Okay. And so let's run through some of the trends. You and I talked last week and we were running through some of the trends, some of the trends we've discussed here, um, some of the trends uh, in our package as well. So um, you mentioned that for you, luxury has sort of re-emerged in a big way in the last two years. So explain what you mean by that and sure. how are you thinking about that? Sure, I think um, just luxury thematically, um, if you start at a high level, if you think travel's $10 trillion, $8 trillion, whatever you wanna call it, it's a big number, right? right. Um, luxury's probably 20%. So you're talking about somewhere between one and $2 billion of, um, I'm sorry, one and $2 trillion of luxury spend. Um, and every forecast you look at, again, you could debate what the exact number is, but it's between eight and 10% forward growth rates. So mm -hmm. Kagers that are almost double the industry. Mm -hmm. um, so big spend, we already sell a ton of luxury. We think we're the biggest luxury seller in the United States for sure. Across the portfolio. Across the portfolio. Um, but it's everything from um, something simple like, look, one of the first things we did at, at as we help the Hertz management team reimagine their business, right? The, a couple of the announcements early on were, how do you electrify the fleet? How do you put a more premium vehicle in the fleet? We went out and ordered 100,000 Teslas. You know, yeah, that 40, was an incredible announcement. Yeah, and it's a $40,000 car versus, which is significantly more than the average car in the fleet. But Hertz already has a big luxury fleet, hmm. and that's an important segment. And you know, so we, we think about how do we really take advantage of that? How do we make sure that um, that as new segments of the market come in to buy luxury. I was just talking to J.D. O'Hara yesterday who runs Internova. Internova, right. And J.D. and I were talking about the luxury trend where it used to be, um, you know, luxury spenders were the top 1%, you know, the, 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 that everybody always refers to. But today, luxury spenders are kind of upper middle class who save a lot of money and do these killer trips that they were never doing. Mm -hmm. You know, certainly when I was, uh, you know, a 25 year old, I wasn't spending, you know, saving my money to go to a Four Seasons, although I worked for an airline, so once in a while I got to, I got to spend, uh, stay at one. Um, but, you know, the, the millennials doing once or twice a year, a big weekend or a big, um, a big one week trip, how do we make sure we capture our fair share of that spend? So we're working on, on things like that. Um, and then just in general, um, whether it's an output of luxury, whether it's selling luxury, whether it's direct exposure through some of our tour operating product to make sure that we have luxury offerings. We just think, you know, we ought to get our fair share of that. And some companies we look at have really attractive luxury offerings, others have bigger opportunities. So one of our more recent investments is in uh, affiliate travel. So things like university, museum, um, a company called Go Hagen uh, in Chicago. And again, we think there's, that's already a luxury offering. We think mm. we can take that all kinds of places to expand that brand into into And affiliate categories. type travel, so explain a little bit more. So themed travel in that sense, and you like that sector, why? You like it a lot. Um, you know, if you think about people getting back on the road and people getting back to taking three or four trips a year instead of what they might have been doing recently, um, you know, recently they've kind of gone away and not come home uh, in a lot of cases. But yeah. as far as just you know, having a, a, a calendar of trips, something like affiliate travel is really attractive. So again, if you, if you went to uh, Michigan, uh, University of Michigan, you get a couple times a year mail brochure. It's still pretty much a direct mail-based product and from the alumni office, section. right? Yeah. And it's hanging out with other people from Michigan. And you're probably, a, if you go, you're probably a donor. You're probably important to the school. Um, you probably don't price the trip out. You might pay a little bit more to have, you know, the archaeology professor from Michigan on the trip, or mm -hmm. whoever, or the basketball coach, or somebody else who decides to join the trip, and they create a community around it. Um, and you know, that community-based experience. Number one, they sell out all all those trips. Sell out mm -hmm. first of all. Secondly, they're a little less price sensitive. And third, it's it's a pretty upscale trip. Um, we think that's a segment that can be exploited as far as just really doing a better job of getting out to organizations, talking about what we have to offer and taking companies. We actually bought a second company in the same space uh, over the within a, two months of buying Gohagen 
and combined, we're by far the biggest player in that space. Um, but we think both, in both cases, uh, with, with, with a stronger balance sheet, more investment, they can go out and get a, a whole bunch more business. And you also invested in, on the luxury side in a luxury cruise company, correct? Uh, yes. We, so that, that gets back to buying something and looking beyond the core business and saying, how can we do a luxury spin here? We have a company called Mystic Investment. Mystic has three businesses. One, they run all of the river cruises, no matter what brand it is. Uh, up and down the Douro River in Portugal. So they basically are the operator for that river mm. um, and multi-branded operator. That's one business. Yeah. Second yeah. business is uh, Nico, which is a German brand. It's a, it's a cruise brand that's specific to the German market. Um, Mario Ferrara and his family bought that out, out of distress. It was a distressed asset that they bought a few years ago. It's a great business. Germans love to cruise with other Germans. <laughs> um, and, and then the third piece, which is part of what our investment went, went to fund, was um, explorer-class ships in Antarctica and, and, uh, and being able to get to smaller ports. And if you think about luxury, it's not just the product offering, it's is it exclusive? Is it unique? Is it an experience, right? And these smaller ships, say 200 people, uh, people on a ship, um, in the warm weather months can get into ports, as an example, the Amazon Basin that other bigger ships can't get to. So it's not just an, a luxury price point and experience, but it's also experiential in that you can't get to some of these places in a, in a bigger cruise format. Um, so these luxury, I mean, these uh, explorer class ships can really do some unique itineraries. Uh, and we're, that, that brand is off and running. We launched it into the pandemic, um, which wasn't exactly the, the easiest time to launch, right. but it's, it's going well uh, as with those sailings. So we just talked uh, mainly about the consumer facing businesses. Mm -hmm. um, on the B2B side, uh, I'm trying to think of the Sertar's portfolio. Um, Avia, which you're, I think, on the board of, that's yes. one example. But what are the opportunities you're seeing on the B2B side that are large enough for private equity players to be in? Um, I think, well, we'll talk, obviously, American Express Global Business right. Travel and, and during- Which now you're in we, the process we, of taking public. We're in the process of taking public. We're also in the process of integrating Agencia. So, right. which we bought from Expedia. Um, so we really have doubled down on that business. I mean, since, since Greg and the, and it was the first, the American Express business travel was the deal that launched Sitaris. Correct. And since buying it, I mean, it was the biggest uh, global business travel agency in the world. Um, and since then, they've twice bought the fourth biggest. So they bought first uh, Hog Robinson in the UK, um, most recently, Agencia, and then a number of tuck-ins in various places around the world um, to, to beef up some of the, some of the global uh, markets. So we've definitely doubled down on that space, and we believe, uh, we believe that travel management is going to continue to be a valuable service to corporations. In fact, um, post-pandemic, while the patterns may change, the focus on people, and you heard it here from the, the to hospitality folks that were speaking before me, um, the, the focus on people and employees and getting people together and creating community inside your company is, is, is really something that CEOs might not say keeps them up at night, but it's keeping them up at night. Mm -hmm. um, so not just getting employees, but keeping them, having them be happy, having them feel connected, that will generate travel. So we think business travel is definitely one of those services. Um, Avia, which, uh, which is a European-based company, um, flies a lot of airplanes on behalf of airlines, and you could think of it as recycling capacity in that they provide seasonal capacity to airlines. Um, so if you think about European outbound, um, there's seasonal demands there. If you think about Canadian outbound, you know, Canadians travel in the winter to warm weather. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Europeans travel all over the place in the summer, um, and the airlines don't have to have full year capacity, they have partial capacity, it's called ACMI services, it's when you provide the crew and the maintenance and the aircraft, um, and Avi is the biggest provider of narrow body ACMI in the world. We also have a big cargo business there. So we thought it was an interesting adjacency, and our relationships with airlines around the world can really help them. So that was kind of two of the theses in that, in that investment. Returning a little bit back to business travel, just because that's such a huge interest to everybody and where it goes from here, et cetera. Um, we've seen on the, on the, on the, on the venture side, big valuations for companies over the last, certainly over the last year. Mm -hmm. Travel Perk just uh, announced a, a, a large funding round. Um, 
would you be want to be on this end or or the end you're at, which is at the Amex Amex GBT end, which is on the other end of the? Spectrum? Yeah, I mean, look, we've always been a little contrarian on this, right? So our our view has been that there's value in certain parts of travel that we could uh, where we could extract value that wasn't there before. Um, so we, I'd say we, we, we think these businesses have to be at scale. We have the biggest player in, in the world. Um, it's got a relatively new travel inf uh, inf uh, technology infrastructure. We're, what, four years, five years into a brand new replatform technology infrastructure. That's unique versus almost every competitor um, and certainly of a, a, a tech platform that's running volume um, is unique. I think agencies, uh, agencies experience should be informative right. for the rest of the industry and for other investors. Mm -hmm. We like we like where we sit. Um, let's move on to a couple of other things. Uh, you and I talked about ESG and how to invest against, not against, in the ESG space. So um, how are you looking from a, from a large investor perspective versus the startup investor perspective? Uh, on, the, on the ESG space, obviously you have a lot of experience in the airline where so much is happening. Right. Um, in that space, so how are you thinking about it? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll go back to Hertz. The, the, the first thing we started talking about is how do you electrify the fleet, mm -hmm. right? There are destinations who will actually provide incentives to companies that can bring an electrification of a fleet. And you can't do it everywhere right away. Um, there's some geographies where it doesn't work very well, but there's places like some of the islands where governments have said, we'd like any of, our, any of the rental fleets on, the, on, the, on our island, we'd like them to be 100% electrified and we'll provide some incentives to help you do that. Right. So that was you know, a big initiative that we had going into that investment. Um, you know, I just mentioned on, on the obvious solution side, which is a little bit idiosyncratic in how you think about it, but the notion of, of, of recycling capacity across multiple airlines, so taking a plane that flies for a European airline in the summer and recycling it into an airplane that flies for a Latin American carrier in their summer uh, and in Europe's winter, um, and having one airplane do that mission instead of two right. is, is a way to recycle capacity. Um, and then, look, we don't think that, um, that, that, well, we think going out, coming out of uh, COVID, certainly outdoor vacations, anything in, in places that are kind of exotic and interesting are going to be important. But how do you get there? How do you do it responsibly? And I'll, I'll again go back to Atlas, which is the, the brand that Mystic started. Those ships, you know, there's a lot of ships cruising around in that category that are quite old. Some of them are repurposed um, icebreakers. There's all kinds of ships that are in Antarctica and the Arctic. Those ships are gonna have to go away soon. They can't convert to electric. Um, it's not gonna be acceptable, acceptable from an environmental standpoint. So not only is there a business opportunity by displacing them, but we're building brand new ships that you can, you can turn off anything that's combustion on them, convert them to electric at any point in an itinerary and, and cruise responsibly into places that, that are really unique and without spoiling the environment there. Um, let me, um, my last question, then we're gonna go to audience questions. Um, we haven't used the word Web3 that much in the last three hours. Right. Um, uh, which, which I think is a blessing, by the way. Um, would you, um, would you invest, is there anything to invest on so the Web3 crypto world today for you? I don't think for us, again, as a kind of a- Later stage. Ki kind of a later stage investor, probably not. But I think it's really interesting. I mean, you know, I think for you know for the folks out there, it's a, it's it seems a little ambiguous when you start talking about Web three. But I think any time there's a you know any big tech not technology disruption, and we've now been, I mean, we've, some of us, me, I've lived through probably three or four. I would say you know the move, the move from mainframe to to distributed computing, and then from distributed computing to the web, and then. Um, and then the move, the move from uh, central site to cloud, those are four big moves that we've kind of lived through in the last 30 years or so. Every one of them started with, um, with destructing an exi the existing technology, right. and then it gets reconstructed to some level, right? So bundling, I think, bundling, I, and yeah, unbundling, bundling, and unbundling. That, but I think so. That I think for for folks, that the easiest way to talk about Web 3.0 is, you know. I mean, the internet was supposed to make everything democratic, right? That was the, that was the dream. Right. That, that was, was the, the dream. Right. and that's, and so again, started very distributed, 
um, with smaller services, and then what emerged were big consolidated companies that control some level of services. That will invariably happen again, no matter what the next wave is, whether it's whether it's block based, whether it's blockchain based, or whether it's some other trend. I think there's a lot to be determined on who really is going to benefit from Web3 and if it's a real thing or not. I, yeah. I, I know Everybody's some purists would that. say it absolutely is, but there's a lot who say, would say, yeah, there's there's a lot you got to learn before you really um, can say that it's going to be the next thing. Um, let's end with this question from Dennis, Dennis Schall, who's our executive yeah. editor. Yeah. Uh, we have you here. We cannot let you go without asking a GDS question. So uh, what is the, <laughs> what is the I, I, this is like going through trauma again, which yes. I'm sure you don't want to go through. Uh, what is the future of the GDS industry? Plenty of airlines, including Hawaiian, are starting to add surcharges on GDS booking. Where is it heading? Yeah, so Dennis, I'll twitch for you for asking me a GDS question. <laughs> I'm permanently damaged. Um, the look, I think the business model. I think, uh, yeah, we. Had, I had sp I spent my career defending why that model worked, right? And part of it is back to this deconstructing, reconstructing. It's not a model. The industry, not the GDS itself, but the industry, which depends on the GDS as part of it is very difficult to deconstruct because of just how it works every day. And mm -hmm. you have a, a mission that's based on safety as a beginning, as a starting point, and runs almost like a military operation. If you think about what airlines do on a daily basis, and most of the GDS revenues are, are, are airline-based, the airlines on a daily basis run really an amazing, amazingly good military operation, right? right? They, they, they're more or less on time. It's not perfect, but when you think about how much it's grown, with no changes in air traffic control, no investment, no real infrastructure changes at airports, so no, every, also congested, um, more and more planes, more and more people. Um, what they do operationally every day is pretty amazing. Everything else is kind of secondary. So when you get all the way to the long tail of saying, well, where, what about distribution? Yeah, it's interesting from a press perspective, but at the core, you know, it gets talked about in the boardroom maybe once a year, maybe. Because that's not what they focus on. They're focused on running a daily, safe military operation. And I think the industry should be applauded for how well they do that. They do that. Um, on the flip side, you know, change in anything else is distracting and takes long. And if it risks disrupting the core airline, um, it, it's problematic. So I think that what's what started to happen, and to Dennis's comment. Um, the business model has actually evolved quite a bit, even in the five years since I'm out of it. But the stickiness of the process hasn't changed much at all. Hmm. So, um, so things are running through the same pipes. Um, the data moves around kind of in the same way. Uh, there's a few different services that have been offered by, by the GDSs to travel agents and to airlines. But at the end of the day, the core piece of it is still kind of looks a lot in the contractual piece of it looks exactly like exactly. what I left five years ago, mm -hmm. which also five years ago looked exactly like it had 10 years prior to that. Mm -hmm. So look, I, I'm not going to predict where it's going to go from here, but I would say that if you think about where it sits in the priorities of most CEOs in the airline business, it's just not, they just don't spend a lot of time thinking about it. And that means it's hard to change. So fair to say you will not go into investing in a GDS anytime soon. I never say never, but I, it's, it's, it, it's, you know, they're public and it's not really our, one's owned by somebody else. Correct. Um, that's true. It's not really our focus right now. Focus right. Okay. Well, thank you, Tom. This was um, great. I'm sure we can talk uh, for a long time, but thank you again for coming. Thank Thanks you so for much, Ralph. Coming in person. Great seeing Appreciate you guys. It. Okay. All right. All right thanks. Thank you.